Grace and peace to you, and welcome to Light, Leaven, and Salt, our video worship from Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. We are so glad that you're here. As we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship, there are a few things we'd like to share with you. First, here at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church, all are welcome. Young, old, gay, straight, new to the faith, lifelong member, you are welcome here. Second, if you're looking for a place to belong, a deeper faith, or ways to give back, then email membership at fapc.org. We'd love to include you in our community of faith. Third and final, some help with today's service. If you scroll down below this video, you will find three helpful links. These links will be referenced throughout today's service, so we don't want you to miss them. The first link is to today's bulletin. The second link is for visitor sign-ins and prayer requests. And the third link is an invitation to give, allowing you to be an important part of the good work happening here at the corner of 55th and 5th. Friends, we know that even here, across technological time and space, God is with us. Let us worship holy God.
Please stand as you are able and join me in the responsive call to worship. Come, hear the call of God. Speak of me to my people. I will give you the words. I will always be with you as you speak, my words of truth and justice and love. We gather here to worship you, to praise you for your loving presence, and to be strengthened for the calling you have given us. of faith. To come before God with the truth of our lives is in itself an act of faith. For we trust that God is interested in us, interested in our hopes, in our dreams, in our grief, in our fear. And we trust that God's grace and mercy is intended for us. So with that confidence, I invite you to join me in the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin and visible on your screen. Friends, let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name.
Friends, hear and believe the good news. We have come before God with the truth of our lives. And here, we who are broken are made whole. And here, we who are lonely are welcomed into family. And here, we who have done wrong are forgiven and sent to serve. Friends, this is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are healed, welcomed, and forgiven. Thanks be to God for a love like that. of faith at this point we celebrate god's good grace by passing the peace with one another so i invite you to exchange the peace with those around you through a wave an elbow bump or a fist bump friends the peace of christ be with you peace 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 You all may be seated. At this point in the service, we invite all of our young Presbyterians, our kiddos, kindergarten through fifth grade, to come on forward to the front doors to join Miss Jamie for Children's Church. And as they leave, we will send them with a blessing. The words are in your bulletin. Kids, are you ready? Yeah? Okay, church. May God be with you there. May God be with you here. Amen. <laughs> Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, and welcome to worship here at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church on this fourth Sunday after Epiphany here in New York City. Whether you are here in person or joining us online, you bless us with your presence. Every Sunday, we celebrate our friends on live stream. This week, we want to give a shout out to worshipers from Salisbury, North Carolina, San Angelo, Texas, and Gardner, Maine. We see you and share the peace of Christ with you. Live streaming friends, please take a moment after the service to connect with us. It's easy. Simply click your way over to fapc.org and enter your email. Here's Pastor Sarah to continue the celebration of our online community and introduce our newest members and share about the virtual membership class. For the past two weeks, I have had the privilege and joy of leading the digital believing and belonging class with an amazing group of individuals. There were six people that made a commitment last week to join our family of faith, and they became official members, which we were overjoyed about. What is particularly unique about this group is that four of the six new members live outside of the state of New York, and I'm not talking about New Jersey. However, over the course of the pandemic, they have found a home here in this community through the myriad of digital and online engagement options and have decided that they want to honor that pull and become officially connected. So we were overjoyed to welcome them into our community and we are already thinking about ways that we can further support both the members here in New York City as well as those that live far beyond these church walls. So if you are someone who joins us regularly on streaming and are interested in learning more about the digital membership options, then please email membership at fapc.org because there is always room at the table. 
Now, without further ado, I'd like to officially welcome and celebrate our January new member class. That class included Louisa Riot, who joined by letter of transfer and lives in the Upper West Side. Megan Kelly, who joined by letter of transfer, also in the Upper West Side. Barbara and Tom Stiles, who joined by, joined by letter of transfer and come from California. And Rebecca and Tom Wild Wesley, who joined by reaffirmation of faith from Rhode Island. Friends, please give a warm welcome so that these individuals can hear you online. Friends, we do this every week. Every Sunday, we gather together in person and online. Every week, we lean into the beauty of worship, lend our voices to prayer and song, and support each other in this journey of life and faith. We are a diverse crew. We don't all look alike, and we sure don't all think alike, and yet, by the grace of God, we are united. We are knit together in our desire to follow Jesus Christ. If you are a visitor here this morning, would you do me a favor? Would you please stand as you are able and allow us to welcome you? All right. We are all friends here. We all know each other. In case you were shy, and I totally get it, no judgment, it was a joke, it was a joke, it was, uh, I'm like, ah, oh. no, no, um, sometimes it's, it's I, you don't want to stand up, and that's totally okay. If you look in front of you, there's this card here, you could totally fill it out with a pencil or pen, or use it, use the QR code to go online and fill out your info, and we will get back to you this week. One of the things that I love to do is to stand here and say, we're going to have coffee, everybody, and stick around. But because of the Omicron variant, we know that it is highly transmissible and can cross between people regardless of vaccine status. We are not going to have coffee uh, hour, nor will the clergy be greeting at the doors at this time. I know you will graciously support this pause, knowing that we take this action to help slow the transmission of the variant and by extension, assist our healthcare workers by doing our part to reduce the surge in hospitalizations. Tickets are now available for Fair is the Heaven, the upcoming choir concert on Friday, February 11th at 7 p.m. in the Crooklyn Chapel, and also for the first time via live stream. Dr. Ryan Jackson leads the Fifth Avenue Chamber Choir in a slightly larger formation for this spectacular concert of music for double choir. From Renaissance Spain, through modern day America, composers have been captivated by the greater expressive potential of writing choral music in eight parts rather than the traditional four. This promises to be an exciting and immersive evening of glorious choral singing, and we're excited to share it with you. In-person seating for this event will be limited to 50% to allow for physical distancing. We strongly encourage getting your tickets in advance. And those wishing to attend this concert in person will be required to uh, show proof of vaccination upon arrival and properly wear a mask at all times. Please visit fapc.org slash tickets today for more information or to get your tickets. Fifth Avenue's anti-racism response team ARRT has created a number of activities in which to reflect and engage. Up until Lent in the Chestnut Gallery, through the doors behind me, you can tour the art exhibit called A Timeline. Revisit, reflect, rethink. Or you can visit fapc.org slash exhibit for a virtual timeline. It is another look at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church's history through the lens of racial equality. You can also head to fapc.org slash ARRT, and you will also find links to our YouTube channel for the latest 2022 
Fifth Avenue Courageous Conversations videos and more AA ARRT resources in the weeks to come, including a podcast with Pastor Emeritus, the Reverend Dr. Oscar McLeod. And now, an update from our Director of Outreach and Missions, Christine Boyle, on the 2022 Pledge Drive. Good morning. Prior to reminding you how you can make your pledge, I want to share with you one of my favorite outreach stories that occurred over the summer when a group of construction workers approached a place at the table, one of our six outreach programs that serves the homeless, and what occurred. So here we go. Picture it. A wall of lime green and muscle coming towards us. And with no introduction, one of the men says, hey, what is this? Our director of homeless ministry, Seamus Campbell, responded, well, this is a church. (laughs) It made for a pretty funny moment, to which the man responded, no, what are you doing here? We see you in the neighborhood. How great is that? We see you in the neighborhood. Seamus explained we were setting up for our mealtime program to feed the homeless as part of a place at the table, which falls under the Ecumenical Outreach Partnership Program. The next day, that same group of men returned with a construction size load of sandwiches, 400. What we at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church are called to do from within these walls and from this pulpit is seen, felt, and experienced in the streets of New York City and beyond. Simply said, pledge enables this. If you have not yet submitted your pledge, please do so. There are three easy ways to do it. Pledge online at fapc.org slash pledge and look for the commit button to make your 2022 commitment. You can mail your pledge to the church business office or you can call Fifth Avenue's business office at 212-247-0490 extension 3018 and make your commitment. Thank you for enabling all the ministries of Fifth Avenue to serve, to act, and to be with one another. Now, I invite you forward to quiet your minds and open your hearts as we listen to the word of God.
Will you please join me in prayer? Holy Spirit, may you speak to our minds, our hearts, and our souls. We trust in you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The year 2020 was a lot. That may be the biggest understatement I have ever said from the pulpit. The world changed for all of us. We went remote as COVID-19 began to spread around the world and this country. Sit-down restaurants turned into window service only. And I don't, I don't have to tell you all this. You remember it vividly. I've been in so many discussions with my colleagues. I've taken surveys. I've been part of studies where people ask the church, what have they learned during the pandemic? We've had amazing talks about mental health. We all joked on how all of a sudden we became cinematographers and filmed worship from our homes. I still have about like 50 clips of bloopers of me giggling like a little kid trying to record worship. If you want to see them, just let me know. <laughs> Yet, as these studies and surveys have asked us what we learned in 2020 around the pandemic, they rarely ask us about the movement for racial justice that was front and center of the news cycle. Generally, these surveys ask us, how did you grow during the pandemic? But one of the biggest growth spots that I saw in myself and in this church was in response to the murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and others that sparked a worldwide movement for awareness and change around structural racism. For me personally, as an immigrant, I had been widely vocal about immigration and advocating for dreamers. That was easy for me. In 2020, as I saw events unfold, I realized that I rarely spoke up for my black siblings when it came to structural racism. As I investigated and reflected on why, I learned some harsh truths about myself. I learned that for some people, being noticed and being invited to places with power, it is easier when you're not perceived as a threat or a troublemaker. And sometimes speaking up against racial justice can be perceived as troublemaking. And subconsciously, I wanted those places of power. And it was easier to just stay quiet. That was wrong of me. And I have felt the Holy Spirit, without shaming me, calling me to do better. And I've actually seen a similar change in you, Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. As we say in the welcome, we're a diverse crew. We don't all look alike. We don't all think alike. Yet by the grace of God, we are united in the shared desire to follow Christ. And in following Christ, many of you have reached out to us about what the church could do about racial injustice. Many of you asked for resources on learning more. I've seen your small group takes on books to read. I've seen your social media post. And in the summer of 2020, the clergy at that time formed the anti-racism response team to navigate the time that we were living in and how we could best respond to that moment. And it's been an honor to be part of that group for the last year and a half. I love the people in that group. And alongside you, we have had incredible conversations that we hope will lead to change. Within our conversation as an anti-racism response team, what was absolutely clear to us was that our agenda was not to promote political agenda, although that some perceived it as that, but to truly think about racial injustice with a theological and a Christian lens. And we wanted everyone included in these conversations. We didn't long for a bubble in which we all agreed and nodded our heads at everything that was said. We longed for good and honest conversations, as uncomfortable as they may be. So as we continue our conversation, let us turn to the Holy Word as it is read by Elder Salome Nufel, a senior in high school and also a member of our anti-racism response team. Listen to God's holy word. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, 
you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are cursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Salome. Salome's going to Brown next year. A few years ago, our denomination, the Peace USA, invited congregations and presbyteries to become part of the Matthew 25 initiative, inspired by the passage that Salome just read. The invitation to these institutions was to participate and think through three aspects. One, building congregational vitality. Two, dismantling structural racism. And three, eradicating systemic poverty. I'll say it again. Building congregational vitality, dismantling structural racism, and eradicating systemic poverty. The way that presbyteries and congregations go about doing this would be different for each individual institution because different contexts call for different things. In 2019, the Presbytery of New York City voted to be a Matthew 25 Presbytery. And in January of 2020, the Denominational Matters Committee made a motion to our session for us to become a Matthew 25 church. The session voted yes. And in doing so, we affirmed that much of the work that we were already doing is already aligned with the initiatives that Matthew 25 says. I think about the amazing work that our outreach team and the Ecumenical Outreach Partnership does the partnership we have with Frontera de Cristo and the work they do at the border. I think about our partnership with First Presbyterian Church Jamaica. The fact that we have an anti-racism response team shows that we take this Matthew 25 initiative seriously. Yet one of the things that this initiative asks us to do is to consistently check our blind spots. Where have we been complicit in structural racism or systemic poverty? Are there times that we may be ignorantly doing more harm than good? What might we do to educate ourselves on? I believe this Matthew 25 initiative is good for us because we can be proud of the work that we have done and at the same time strive to do better. So we turn to this passage that guides this initiative. Now, I'm going to admit, this is a really odd passage. I think it's clear what it calls of us. It says it right there. We should feed the hungry and thirsty, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, care for the sick, and visit the prisoner. That seems pretty clear. But what do we do with this sheep and goat stuff? What do we do with these images of eternal life and eternal punishment? It's kind of bizarre. So one of the things that we have to remember is that the occupation of a shepherd was one that would be familiar to those who Jesus is speaking to. Although the disciples previously were fishermen, tax collectors, and other occupations, they generally knew the role of a shepherd. 
Goats and sheep were intermingled throughout the day. And at night, when it was time to settle down, the shepherds began to separate the sheep from the goats. That was routine. So this imagery, to those hearing it, is not so far-fetched. Yet what I think hangs most people up is the imagery of the righteous, which according to the passage are those who care for the marginalized and the poor, will have eternal life. And those who do not will go away into eternal punishment. What do we do with this aspect of the passage? Because we know that we all have fallen short at some point or another. And don't we confess our sins and are reminded of Christ's forgiveness? Doesn't the book of Romans say that nothing can separate us from the love of God? Is this grace thing really true? Throughout the scriptures and in the book of Matthew, grace reigns. Romans 5 reminds us that the good news of the gospel is that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we trust in everlasting grace. And I actually think that Jesus does something incredibly creative and powerful when bringing up this judgment imagery. If you're consistently fixated on who is in and who is out, then you're missing the point. The point is clear of what Jesus wants of you. Jesus wants you to participate in deep justice and gives you a blueprint. And when you do this, you get to participate in actions of justice and liberation, and you actually experience what salvation looks like. You see the images of the kingdom of God that are unlike anything other that you've seen. But those that are fixated on who gets in and who gets out, they're missing the point. They're missing this experience in the kingdom of God. A commentator for this passage puts it this way. In many ways, Matthew's depiction of the last judgment is a wellness check. Its purpose is not to condemn or scare, but to provide a snapshot of our overall health, development, learning, and growth that should lead us to new habits and ways of life. After all, as our doctor wants us to flourish, so does our creator, redeemer, judge, and king. And this makes sense to me. When I go for my annual physical, they generally tell me the things that I should be working on. And when I follow those things, it sets me up for success and I experience life better. Yet when I ignore, or typically ignore, it, my body doesn't feel quite right. This passage is not meant to condemn, but to inspire to actually take seriously what Jesus calls us to do. And we see this often in the American Christianity. There is a passion to evangelize in hopes of saving souls. There's this desire to steep our heads into doctrine and try to get to know the divine more with our minds. All the while, we ignore the body and forget that we are called to take care of people holistically. If we are to take Jesus' word seriously, presenting the gospel is more than just mind and soul. It also feeds the body. And for too long, the American church has forgotten that. It has said, just preach the gospel. Don't talk to me about this justice stuff. But justice is part of the gospel of Jesus. In fact, when debating slavery, some argue that slavery was justified because they could convert African slaves into Christianity and save their eternal souls. That's not true salvation. Salvation is more holistic than that. Salvation includes liberation. And this is why we need to take this wellness check in Matthew 25 more seriously, because people's bodies and lives are at stake. Our good friend, the Reverend Dr. Charlene Han Powell, says that at the crux of Matthew 25 is not a call to right belief, but a call to right relationship with God and with one another. Whatever we do to our siblings, we do to Christ. And throughout the Gospels and the parables, we see G Jesus talking about this kingdom that is unlike any other kingdom. Reverend John Molina Moore, another friend of Fifth Avenue, says that every kingdom built by humans has fallen short. They all put borders to say who is in and who is out. Every empire and kingdom in some way is not equal for all people. And somehow or another, each kingdom has made someone else feel less than. Yet in Jesus' kingdom, we get to participate 
in this practice that turns all of that upside down and welcomes all to the table of Christ where everyone belongs. Imagine with me. You're invited over for this amazing meal. It's almost lunchtime. I'm getting hungry. There is all of your favorite foods and then some foods that you've never tried before and you think, good golly, that's good. And you're glad that you are there. You have a place at the table. And when it comes to those that are hungry and thirsty and downtrodden, it is vital for them to have a place at the table. It is vital for the church that they have a place at the table. Christ invites everyone at the table, and we get to participate in bringing them to that table. But I want you to continue to imagine with me. We've been at that dinner with good food, but you feel too uncomfortable to speak up. The conversation going around is good, and you listen, and you feel like you can contribute. But you also feel like your voice would be overshadowed by others. At Christ's table, your voice has meaning, and you have a voice at the table. So now this meal with good golly good food also has another layer of deepness to it. Jokes are going around, and thoughtful and meaningful conversation is happening. And at Christ's table, you not only have a place at the table, but you also have a voice at the table. When it comes to racial equality, those who have been marginalized and left out of the conversation, we strive for them to not just have a place at the table, but also a voice at the table. And to have a voice at a big dinner table like this means that some people will have to take time to listen, to affirm, and to engage. We're called to bring people to the table, but to also to let them have a voice at the table. But there's more. Continue to imagine this big old dinner with me. There's good golly good food. The conversation is flowing and it's great. But you're fully aware that you're in somebody else's home. And it would be rude to go to the refrigerator and grab yourself another beverage. And you know that at some point, you need to go home. Because as good as that was, you just don't quite belong there. At Christ's table, you not only have a place at the table, a voice at the table, but most importantly, you belong. You are family. When my parents have people over at their home, my dad always says to their guest, esta es tu casa, this is your home. And I know he means it because I know nothing will delight my dad more than seeing people kick off their shoes, go to the pantry and grab a bag of chips and a soda from the fridge, and then to sit down, join the conversation, and be part of the family. And when I look at the scriptures, what Jesus does time and time again is remind people that they belong, that they are indeed beloved children of God. And we see Jesus doing this not just by feeding the hungry and welcoming the stranger. Jesus does this by trying to dismantle and shake up the systems that have people hungry to begin with. Jesus shakes up the system and structures that tell a woman from Samaria that she is unwelcome just because where she's from. And friends, if we are to take Jesus' words seriously, then we must participate in this family-like banquet where all should belong. When we exclude others based on their race, economic status, sexuality, or gender identity and expression, we divide the table. This table is there. But what happens when there are roadblocks in the way to get to that dinner? So when Jesus gives us this wellness check of faith, how are we doing in regards of inviting and showing people that they belong? How is your wellness check individually and us as Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church? I asked our youth last week what they thought. I asked them, what does Matthew 25 mean to you? And how can we better participate in dismantling structural racism and eradicating systemic poverty? And one of our students said that we must have open conversations. We must learn from other people's experience because you cannot do this kind of work alone. 
You need other people. And after she said that, another student chimed in and said, it's true. And part of it is that we just don't know much about it. We haven't truly been educated on why things are the way they are. We don't know the roadblocks to getting to the table. About a year ago, our anti-racism response team put out a curriculum that presented opportunities for learning and discussion. And this was gone around in many community groups, and I visited a variety of these groups. And what was most profound was hearing from groups of diverse ages saying, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. For instance, one that shocked many of our congregation members was hearing about the racial discrimination of the GI Bill after World War II. This bill provided subsidized mortgages to millions of people coming back from the war to purchase their first homes. Many of our congregation members said that the GI Bill helped their families pass down homes and helped create a good path forward for their parents and ultimately them. Yet the way the GI Bill was administered, it left one million black veterans on the outside looking in. In New York and New Jersey, the GI Bill insured 67,000 mortgages. 67,000. Fewer than 100 of those went to veterans that were not white. In Mississippi, 3,200 of these mortgages were given to returning veterans. 3,200. Only two were given to black veterans. As a result, more white families were able to build equity, growing wealth for retirement and education for their children. But that was not true for most of the black veterans. And that is just one of the ways that structural racism has fabricated through our structure. One of the ways that you can take your wellness check seriously is by doing the hard work of educating yourselves and listening to the stories of others. There are great material out there for you. If you go to our website and look at our curriculum, you will find videos, articles, podcasts, and so much more. And it is a gift to hear and read stuff from Austin Channing Brown in her book, I'm Still Here, or Karen Gonzalez in her book, The God Who Sees Us, Immigrants, the Bible, and a Journey to Belong, or Caitlin Curtis in her book, Native, Identity, Belonging, and a Place to Belong. There is a plethora of great material out there. What is your wellness check? Do you need more education? Do you need to start thinking about your places of employment and how people are welcomed there? If you're a manager or an owner or a coach or a waiter, what kind of growth do you need to dismantle racist structures? There is no shame, no shame of knowing where you are in your own assessment. But what are you going to do to live better? What is our wellness as a church, as Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church? The senior pastor and our state of clerk asked the anti-racism response team to think and help the church process the discovery that three of our founding members, including our founding pastor, Reverend John Romaine, the fact that they were slaveholders during the time of being here at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. And that through the existence of this church, there were up to 85 more. That is a tough part of our family history as a church. As Dale Hansen, our archivist, said in an interview, which you can view on our YouTube page, and I'm paraphrasing him a little bit, he said, we can be very proud of our involvement to the city, country, and world for the last 200 years. But we do have some dark spots. Dale also shared with me that throughout his extensive research, the church was largely silent on the topic of slavery during the Civil War. At that time, Reverend Rice was the pastor here. In our centennial book, which is a record we have of our history from 1808 to 1908, says that Reverend Rice held the affection and esteem of the people by avoiding political topics. It was far easier to say nothing about slavery than to approach the topic at all. But now that we have this information, how do we repent of this? How do we repair? Are we going to take a page from Reverend Rice and just avoid the topic? 
I find hope that we have decided to have these conversations and that our session will be presented with recommendations for decisions on how we can better participate in dismantling racism. Dale says in his interview, we need to be put in difficult and uncomfortable situations because they will stick with us. We will forget the pleasant things very quickly. And taking a wellness check is uncomfortable. Again, we can be proud of the work we have done so far. I can't tell you how inspired I am by the questions you have been asking. The way that a Wednesday morning Bible study decides to talk about racial justice at least once a month. I have been fed and inspired by the wise words around racism that has been said from this pulpit by my colleagues. And I am floored by the adult education opportunities happening here. My heart is full and I am proud of this church family. And at the same time, I'm hopeful for more things to come because you all are driven and try your hardest to listen to the spirit when she speaks. And love will find a way to move the needle. And even if we were to say no, the good news is love will find a way to reach out to the hurting and the marginalized. Throughout the Holy Scriptures, God rescues the oppressed time and time again. Because love always finds a way. Even if churches, institutions, and empires say no to those who should belong, love will find a way. And it's up to us whether we ride that wave of love. And it won't be safe. It won't be easy. But it is certainly good. For those of you who have had to bear the weight of prejudice, racism, and ignorance, I am deeply sorry. That is something you should never have to experience. Know that you are a beloved child of God, and God has your back. God hears your cries, and love will find a way. Now, I know there might be some of you out there who might be thinking, Werner, I can't do this. I cannot think about structural racism anymore. I can't separate this kind of liberation from political views or agendas. And I just don't like it. Okay. But know this. You are still my sibling in Christ, and you are also a beloved child of God. And love will find a way. My hope and prayer is that at some point you may accept the offer to learn more. And I promise you that the kingdom will taste so much sweeter when seeing how wide and how big Christ's table is. May you taste and see that the Lord is good. Will you please stand with me as you are able and affirm with us our faith as it comes from the Belhar Confession. We believe that God has revealed God's self as the one who wishes to bring about justice and true peace among people. That God in the world full of injustice and enmity is in a special way the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wrong. That God calls the church to follow God in this. For God brings justice to the oppressed, gives bread to the hungry, that God frees the prisoner and restores sight to the blind, that God supports the downtrodden, protects the stranger, helps orphan and widows, and blocks the path of the ungodly, that for God, pure and undefiled religion is to visit the orphans and the widows in their suffering, that God wishes to teach the church to do what is good and to seek the right. Amen. Thank you.
You may be seated. Friends, let us turn to God in prayer. Holy God, we are here again, pulling our hearts out onto our sleeves, bowing our heads, hoping to catch a glimpse or a shimmer of you. And as we look back over the last week, we ask ourselves, where was it that we saw you? And then we remember, oh, of course, we saw you in sunrises, in homemade birthday cakes, and in a beautiful snow day. We saw you in meals around the table, in warm cups of tea and in phone calls with loved ones. We saw you in random acts of kindness, in headlines that brought good news, and in candles that kept the night at bay. Sometimes we forget, but we saw you, and we want to see you more. That's why we're here, God. So remind us. Those who are hungry, they belong to you. Those who are burdened with the weight of unfair oppression, they belong to you. Those who make decisions out of fear, those who are tangled up with addiction, those who speak unfamiliar languages or live in unfamiliar neighborhoods, they belong to you. And if we look, we just might see you in the melting ice caps and in the victims of gun violence and in hospital corridors. And we know that if we look, we just might see you in our Jewish siblings and in our Muslim siblings and in our atheist siblings. And if we look, we just might see you. So God, we're asking that you would help us look. Open our eyes. Because we don't want to get to the end of our days and ask, where was it that we saw you? When was it that we saw you? So gracious God, we are here again, pulling our hearts out onto our sleeves, bowing our heads, hoping to catch a glimpse or a shimmer of you. Remind us that you are everywhere, gathering up our prayers in your hands and helping us look. So now with hope in our hearts, we pray the words your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, all that we have and all that we are are gifts from God. From our life to our breath to our friendships and our financial resources, God has blessed us. And so we give, not as if we can pay God back, but we give out of gratitude. One of the ways that this church puts your gifts to good use is through our ministry of music. During a typical program year, Fifth Avenue is home to three adult choirs, a youth choir, and a children's choir. These diverse groups offer an opportunity for people of every age and ability to make a joyful noise and raise their voices in sacred song. In worship services, our musicians answer the call to be instruments of God's love, to provide an oasis of beauty for all who encounter us on their spiritual journey. 
Fifth Avenue also hosts a series of beloved concerts, including our upcoming winter concert on February 11th and the Linton concert in April. We hope our gift of sacred music is a source of beauty, comfort, and joy for you during this challenging season. Friends, this is just one of the ways that your pledges and gifts are sustaining the work of Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. So during our offertory anthem today, we will invite you to give. And not by passing the plates, instead we have provided other ways. If you look in the pew in front of you, you will find a Give QR code that you can use your phone's camera to access a secure giving link. Live streaming friends, you will see this code on your screen. Of course, we also wanna include our friends who prefer cash or checks. So if that applies to you, you may drop your envelopes found in the pews at one of the plates located at the exits of the sanctuary. Thank you for supporting the many ministries of this church. And thank you so much for your generosity. Let us give with grateful hearts.
please join me in, in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are God of the infirm and the hale, the imprisoned and the free, the poor and the rich, the hungry and the sated. We offer up these gifts to you, humbly asking that they serve those in need, so that we may serve you as you commanded us. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship today. As we said at the top of the hour, you are always welcome here. If you're seeking ways to dig deeper or to get involved, reach out. We have devotionals, podcasts, service opportunities, small groups, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. We'd love to include you. Friends, go in peace. Know that you are loved and come back soon. Friends, love will find a way. May you participate in that love. Siblings in Christ, you are loved, and through the grace of God, you are enough. Amen. Amen.